you're not really a full-time fighter yet, are you? Uh, I would consider myself a full-time fighter. Yeah, I put in all the hours, and um, you know, um, they work with me at work on those things too. So, yeah. how do you do that? How do you juggle? Uh, it's probably no different for me than it is for some of these guys, you know, because I know these guys uh, that are full-time fighters that are also training classes at their gym and, and doing things like that. And then instead of me training people, uh, I'm an engineer and I'm cranking out numbers in my head or trying to. Depends if I get punched real hard that day. <laughs> then I usually just go grab the broom and look busy. <laughs> what sort of engineer? Uh, I graduated uh, School of Mines with a mechanical engineering degree, but I work for um, a potable water district, so we serve uh, water to the public, and I work on the hydraulic model and infrastructure design and interesting stuff like that. So another one of these musclehead morons who gets in bar fights, uh, has no other option, would be on the streets otherwise, right? Yeah. Yeah, I'd be on the streets otherwise. <laughs> I, that is funny, though, when because there still is this image that, you know, you guys are barroom brawlers and idiots and, you know, uh, and there, there actually are a lot of, you know, collegiate uh, wrestlers and college educated guys. Um, it's probably more the norm than the, the abnorm. I'll tell you what, uh, in, as far as all the uh, sports and athletics I've been involved in, these uh, the fighters are probably the uh, greatest group of guys that have respect for each other and other people and uh, are very intellectual as well. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's almost like we should give credit to, I think, a lot of different athletes out there. This one, as as I learn more about it, I'm sure as you learn more about it, it really is a thinking person sport before, after, uh, in terms of breaking down fights, making adjustments in the fight. But it's not like other sports, you know, as a football player, you're, you're not, you can't be an idiot playing offensive line, right? I mean, it's, no. it's, 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 no. it's always this misnomer that, you know, people just go out there and it's based on pure athletic ability. And maybe at the highest level, you actually do have to be that extra level in terms of intelligence. Yeah, you know, it, when I was competing in college, too, you know, some of the smartest guys I know uh, were, were uh, pigs, as we call them, or hogs. They're yeah. the, they were the old linemen. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, you know, there was, this, you know, math, math guys and engineers and, you know, the, just all, all different walks of life. They're really no different than anybody else out there that's trying to get a college education. They just uh, happen to be athletically gifted as well. Yeah. You want to take that back about defensive ends? About defensive ends? Yeah. Oh, that's just O-linemen. They're, they're the ones that are the hogs. That's so. what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you want to take it back about defensive ends, about being smart. Oh. Outside linebackers, pretty much pin your ears back. There's not really much design. Yeah. It, it, it's, it, that's, why, uh, that's why middle linebackers get a call to play. So they're, they're definitely the smart <laughs> ones. <laughs> Talk about your uh, – I know it's been covered a little bit, but your football career, because you, you were close, and then you got injured. But, I mean, you, you know, you're, what, 34 now, yeah. right? You, I mean, you could be closing out an NFL career right now. You could be at the tail end of an NFL career. You were close and then just got a couple of bad breaks. Yeah, you know, uh, it, was, it was close. I, I had the opportunity to play in the Senior Bowl, and um, I was in the Indianapolis Combine and bulged three discs and ruptured a disc in my back. And, uh, you know, that, that definitely sets you on the sidelines, and they don't like to take a look at uh, injured rookies that are coming in. So um, it, was a, it was an opportunity for me. But like I said, you know, God has a plan for us all, and uh, his plan was definitely for me to be in MMA, and, and uh, that's where I feel most blessed and most athletic and uh, can perform at my best. All right. So where do you feel you are now? You've had two fights in UFC. You had uh, eight outside the organization, at least professionally. Um, now this looks like a pretty big step up in terms of a well-rounded guy. Yeah, Gabe, uh, I, you know, he's the whole package, and that's why he's a top 10 fighter in the world. And uh, I'm extremely excited to have this opportunity. And, um, uh, you know, as, as far as me and fighting, I, I love it. And, uh, you know, I still have a lot to learn. I'm still uh, pretty young as far as, this, you know, me training in the sport. It's only, you know, three, three or four years. So, uh, you know, I still have a lot to learn. So a lot of the focus is still on me and still learning. Do you get irked when guys like me say he's well-rounded, uh, intimating as if you're not? Uh, no, you know that's uh, you know Gabe is well-rounded, and um, it doesn't it doesn't irk me anyway, and that's uh, you know something that I perceive myself as too. Yeah, I was gonna say it, it's it's tough though when you look at your your track record and the fights we've seen to go. Well, he's got all the game because what we've seen in UFC has just been obliteration, you know, taking guys yeah. out. But when you look at your your background in terms of all your fights, you actually you know you scored some submissions, so you've been in uh, you know all different realms of the cage. Yeah, you know, and then I have uh, I train with some of the top guys in the world. You know, we got a bunch of number ones in there in our training camp, and uh, you know, perennial top tens, and uh, so I'm in there working on you know ground game, uh, striking, and wrestling, and and everything with them too. So uh, I know what I'm capable of. How long have you been with Jacksons? Uh, well, I've been with Jacksons and, and Tees uh, for probably almost a year and a half now. Okay. And what's uh, what's it been like? Let's let's concentrate on on Greg and that camp because, like you said, all the number ones that you work with. Um, but in terms of breaking down the game, because it just seems like there's this building thing uh, each fight card where you watch Jackson fights and you're like, wow, um, you know, game plan wise, it seems like 
the, the Jackson guys have an edge. Am I wrong? Uh, no, you know we uh, all all of our trainers and you know you know Greg he's a he's a great game planner and uh, he can uh, pick out people's weaknesses and and your strengths and uh, you know make the most of it for each and every one of his fighters. What does it mean to be with all those number ones? Because because you can be around great fighters and maybe you get nothing from them. How are you guaranteed to get something from whoever Rashad or Keith Jardine or uh, George St. Pierre? Uh, you know, I think one di one thing that's different about our guys in our camp is it's like a fraternity. We're like a family in there, and um, you know, we're all brothers, and uh, um, nobody is is got a bigger head than anybody else. And uh, when those guys are like that, and, and they're conveying their thoughts on the younger guys and guys that are coming up, and uh, you know what they need to work on, and and just helping the whole team out as a whole, uh, it makes the the whole group coagulate together and, and make us all that much stronger. So let's spend one more minute on uh, Gonzaga in terms of his game. Um, what have you seen in, in some of his fights, especially his losses, that maybe is something to pick out? Am I wrong in saying, and I'm not a fighter, so you know, obviously Gabe would smash me, but judging from, you're laughing at that comment. You, you think <laughs> I'm not a fighter? Um, but uh, in watching a couple of his losses, it, it kind of seemed like there was a moment in the fight where maybe the opponent, whether it was Couture or Verdum, kind of broke him mentally. And I, I don't know if, that's, if, if I'm misreading that or if that's something you go in and go, you know what, if I close space on this guy and start mauling him, maybe it changes. Yeah, you know, that's, uh, you know, thing, uh, people have pointed things out like that before, but, uh, you know, I, I'm always expecting and every time that I go out to fight is uh, that person to be their best and uh, somebody that's definitely at their best would never have that uh, type of mentality. So that's not any, anything that I can expect. Now, this is a man's man, not only because he's uh, gigantic, about, you know, 6'3 and 275, but the other thing is a lot of men, and I'm one of them, cannot deal with the fact that uh, there are women out there who are taller than them. You're still with the same lady, right? Yeah, I hope. Okay. Okay. Because yeah. uh, cause I, I, I don't like it. You know, I'm, I'm not that tall a guy anyway. And, uh, you know, if I'm getting towered over, but I think in heels, she's actually taller than you. Yeah. If uh, my wife, Lonnie, if she's uh, in her heels and I'm flat footed, I think she might be just to edge me out there by a little bit. No, no, no not to edge you out. I saw you in Atlanta and she was taller <laughs> than you. Now, don't, don't back down now. Yeah. I mean, uh, you're bigger than everyone. Can you let someone else be bigger than you? Yeah. Well, I stand 6'3 and Lonnie's 5'11, but in heels, I'll, I'll give her the 6'3. Right. And she's all, just so you know, she's not like 275 either. No. She's a little smaller. She's not a sparring partner. <laughs> no. <laughs> there you go, Shane Carwin. Thanks.